Ok, muito obrigado. Está aqui mais um poço. Here's one more well from Lake Havasu. God loves you. Vamos marcar data. Dia 6 de fevereiro não é? desse ano. Thank you, Lake Havasu. Here's a group that we found today when we came out to do some evangelism. If you did not understand those words, muito obrigado. Lake Havasu means thank you very much, Lake Havasu. That is one of eight villages where you now have a well that uh, you have provided through what you have given as a church. And I, I can only say you would have to have been in those villages and, and seen the water that they were drinking to appreciate the water that was coming out of that spout. It is amazing. And it's because of what you have given and what you have done that they are able to have clean and pure drinking water and also able to hear the good news of the living water of Jesus Christ. So thank you, Lake Havasu. Thank you, Calvary Church. Now, you also, at the same time you were giving that, also achieved something last year. For the second year in a row, Calvary Baptist Church and Lake Havasu gave the highest amount of giving. You're the number one giving for um, mission causes across our uh, Arizona Southern Baptist Convention. You are the number one giving church. That's amazing. God bless you. <clears throat> and through what you gave, you helped send missionaries like John Dina. You heard his voice uh, on that video. And about 4,000 missionaries going around the world, about 130 different countries. You also helped plant churches in North America. You helped plant churches here in Arizona. You supported organizations like Arizona Baptist Children's Services, as well as Gateway Seminary. And some of uh, your church members have been going through uh, Gateway Seminary. And all of that you have done by giving to this thing we call the cooperative program. And I just want to say thank you on behalf of all of those lives who have been touched and uh, ministers who have been trained and all of those uh, families that have been helped through Arizona Baptist Children's Services, all of that. Thank you so much for what you've given. While you were doing that, you also baptized 108 people last year. And uh, to God be the glory. God's doing great things here. Now, I wanted to, to brag on you. And after I've done that, I've encouraged you. Now I'm going to talk to you about pride. <laughs> uh, it's kind of ironic. But uh, when Pastor Chad asked if I would come and, and help out during this time when he's on sabbatic, and I was so uh, grateful for that invitation, he said, we're doing this series called How Not to Be an Idiot. And he said, it's a, a study in the book of Proverbs. And he gave me a list. Here are some things that we're talking about. And uh, he gave me a choice. And I chose this topic of pride and humility. Because it's something that I struggle with. And I think we all struggle with this. And it's something that we need to learn. And the book of Proverbs has so much to say about the dangers of pride and literally the, the idiocy of living with pride because really only an idiot lives with pride there's so many bad things that result from this i mean athletic teams have lost games because of pride now arguably the the biggest upset in united states sports history occurred in 1980 when our u.s hockey team beat the soviet team for the for uh, well it was a semifinal round, but went on and, and won the gold medal in hockey that year. How many of you remember that game? Called the Miracle on Ice, right? The truth is, the Soviet team was really proud. They had not lost the gold medal in hockey since 1964. They had been on a run, and they had beaten team after team after team. In fact, earlier that year, they had beaten the U.S. team 10-3. to and so when they were playing them in the, in the semifinal game, they're, who are these guys? I mean, we've, we've already beaten these guys. And our team came up and beat them. Well, the Soviet team had a lot of pride, and it caused them to lose the game. Well, we've had armies that have lost battles because of pride. Countries have lost wars because of pride. Companies have gone out of business because of pride. How many of you remember this symbol right here? Remember that? Okay, some of you don't because you're so young. Kodak used to own the camera and film business worldwide. If it was going to be good, it had to be done on Kodak film, right? 
You know who invented the digital camera? It was actually Kodak. Yeah. And, and when it was invented, they said, you know, this is really not going to amount to anything. I mean, digital photography, it will never, ever be able to match film photography. And so from the very beginning, they said, we're not going to do anything with this. We're just going to continue to sell cameras and film like we always have because we are the top of the industry. Now, every one of you in this room has a digital camera in your pocket. And Kodak is out of business, <laughs> at least in this country. They actually operate in Europe. So pride causes companies to go down. I'm going to show you another picture because pride also causes people to die. Who knows that guy? Anybody know who that is? Well, let me give you just a hint. He has the shortest tenure of any U.S. president that ever lived. You know who it is? I don't hear it. William Henry Harrison. William Henry Harrison. He was president for 31 days, and that wasn't because he was impeached because he fired somebody. <laughs> I'm glad some people got that. That's, I appreciate that. Thank you. No, what happened was on his day of inauguration, it was a cold and rainy day in Washington, D.C., and, and he wanted to prove that he was as tough as Andrew Jackson. And so he refused to wear a top coat in the parade on that day. And he got cold, and he got wet, and he got pneumonia, and 31 days later, he was dead. Shortest tenure of any American president. Pride killed William Henry Harrison. Pride kills marriages, it kills families, kills relationships. Pride does all kinds of damage. So we need to learn how to get rid of pride, how to put pride in its place if we're going to learn how not to be an idiot because only an idiot allows pride to continue in his life. Now, the book of Proverbs has a lot to say about pride. So I want to ask you if you'll get that little outline out that you have in your bulletin. <clears throat> I'm going to just tell you some of the things that Proverbs says about pride and I'm going to read some scriptures for you. You won't have time to find all of them because I'm going to, I'm going to go through this, but I'm going to give you some verses that you can write down, okay? Some references to write down. So I'm going to do this so you can, you can at least have this in front of you. The first statement is that pride is an abomination to the Lord. Proverbs 16.5. Let me read this for you. Proverbs 16.5. Everyone who is arrogant in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Be assured, he will not go unpunished. An abomination is something that God cannot stand. Everyone who is proud, arrogant in heart. The next statement is that pride leads to dishonor. Proverbs 11.2. Write that down. Proverbs 11.2. When pride comes, then comes disgrace. But with the humble is wisdom. Proverbs 11.2. The third statement is that pride leads to destruction. Proverbs 16.18. Proverbs 16.18 says, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. That's what we've always heard, isn't it? Pride goes before the fall. All right, the next statement says, God hates pride. Proverbs 8.13. You can write that little verse down. Proverbs 8.13. The fear of the Lord is hatred of evil. Pride and arrogance in the way of evil and perverted speech, I hate. And then the last statement there is pride is sin. Proverbs 21, 4. Haughty eyes and a proud heart, the lamp of the wicked, are sin. Proverbs 21, 4. Now, why do I ask you to write those down? Well, because I think it's a warning to us. It's a warning about the danger of pride. Why is pride so 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 perilous why is pride so offensive to god why is pride so condemned in the book of proverbs well proverbs is hard or, or pride is hard to define but let me just give you some characteristics of pride can i do that the first one is that pride wants glory pride wants the credit pride pride wants others to see what it does and who it is. Pride loves to be able to parade in front of others. Pride wants the glory. So last night someone asked me, he said, is there any such thing as good pride? Like, you know, I'm, I'm proud of my grandchildren, or I'm proud of my church, or, or I'm proud of, uh, of something that I've done that was good. 
Well, there is a good kind of pride, but here's the difference. When pride, when it's, when it's proud, you're taking credit yourself, but it can be used to bring glory to God. When you're pointing to God and giving him the glory and letting people see, here's something that God has done as opposed to what you have done or even what we have done, then it's not pride. But pride wants the glory. The second statement is pride wants to be first. You ever watched a bunch of elementary school students when it's time to line up? Everyone wants to be first in line. They want to be the line leader. They want to be the first one to the playground, the first one to the cafeteria, the first one to the next place. They want to be first. That's, that's just who we are. It, it's, it's in our sinful hearts. We want to be first. And, and because of that, we want to have power. We want to have possessions. We want to have position. That's why those three are so big among people. Who has the biggest and the best? Who has the most expensive? Who has the, who has the, the most? All of that is because of pride. Pride wants to be first and wants to be considered better or more important than others. And the third thing is that pride wants its own way. We are like spiritual two-year-olds. We, we want to do it ourselves. And we want to do it our own way. We don't want anyone telling us what to do or how to do it. That is the problem between us and God. We don't want God telling us what to do. And his word gives us clear instructions. And we, want, we don't want God to be in control of our lives. We want to be in control of our lives. All of that is just an indication of, of spiritual pride. And it's, it's the sinfulness of the human heart. That's why it's so offensive. That's why the book of Proverbs warns about it, because pride really does lead to destruction and to death. One of the best, one of the best parables of that, just illustration that comes out of history, is, is what happened with the ship called the Titanic. Now, the, the Titanic was a famous ship. They made a, a movie out of it, which some of that was true. Um, but the truth is the Titanic was designed to be the most indestructible ship that was ever built. It was supposed to be the best engineered ship. Everything about it was supposed to be the strongest and the best that, that was ever made. In fact, you can tell by this old travel poster, it was the world's largest liner. They were trying to attract people to come and be on the Titanic. It, it was considered indestructible. In fact, one, one crew member was overheard saying that only even God could not sink this ship. And they were so filled with that pride and that arrogance that they, they went headlong across the North Sea in spite of those, those icebergs that were in the way because they felt like nothing could stop this ship. And when most captains would have pulled back to half speed so that they might be able to see where those icebergs were and move out of their way, they went full speed through that field. And you know the story. On April the 15th, 1912, they struck an iceberg, and that iceberg ripped the side of the Titanic open, and it sank, bringing 1,500 people to their death. But it's a picture of human pride. It's what we do when we're proud. We, we go headlong into things, not even minding the danger. We think nothing can stop us. We've got this. Nothing, nothing can do us harm. And I will tell you, Pride will sink your ship. Pride will sink your ship. It's pride that causes us to, to never admit or want to admit that we've done anything wrong. It's, it's pride that causes us not to want to listen to anything that the Word says or that anyone that has wisdom says to us. It's, it's pride that, wants us, that makes us want to be in control. All of those things come out of pride. How does pride show up in your life? And I know how pride shows up in my life. One of the ways pride shows up in my life is I, I have this tendency to want to do things in my own strength. And so my tendency is I've got this. I'm, I'm gonna, I, I can do this. So I start out into something, and I, my philosophy is, okay, God, if I need you, uh, I'll call on you. I'll let you know. My tendency is to depend on my own strength my own ingenuity, my own intelligence, and, and, and to leave God out of the picture instead of being completely dependent on God. How does pride show up in your life? Maybe it shows up in your life with not wanting to admit that you're wrong. 
Maybe pride shows up in your life by, by not allowing God to really be in control of your life. Maybe pride shows up in your life by wanting to get the credit for all the things that you do or have done. I don't know how it shows up in your life, but you do. And the truth is, there is an antidote to pride. And the antidote to pride is humility. For as much as the book of Proverbs has to say about pride and the danger of pride, it also talks to us about humility and how we need to have humility in our hearts and in our lives. Here are some things that the book of Proverbs says about humility. In Proverbs 3.34, kind of the focus verse for our, for our study, it says, Toward the scorners he is scornful, but to the humble he gives favor. God gives grace to the humble. In Proverbs 29, 23, humility leads to honor. It says, one's pride will bring him low, but he who is lowly in spirit will obtain honor. Proverbs 29, 23. Proverbs also says that humility is rewarded. In Proverbs 22, 4, it says, the reward for humility and fear of the Lord is riches and honor and life. Proverbs 22, 4. And then humility is wisdom. Proverbs 11.2 says, When pride comes, then comes disgrace. But with the humble is wisdom. Now you just put these verses and these statements about pride and humility across from one another, and what you discover is that pride is dangerous and humility is what we need. We need humility. Now what does humility look like? Let me give you just, just some descriptions of humility. The first one is that humility submits to God. Humility recognizes who God is. He is the creator. He is the Lord over all things. He, he's the one that made us. And you begin with this attitude as he is the creator, we are the creation. And that runs counter to the way the world thinks because the world says, well, there is no God. We're, we're just here because, because life developed this way. And because of that, we're on our own. We'll do whatever we want to do. Thank you very much. And they don't begin with that attitude. But humility submits to God. And because it recognizes that we have a creator, and recognizes we've been placed here, now it begins to recognize that that creator, God, has, has given us instruction. And he's revealed himself to us. And he has shown us how he wants us to live. And so, so humility says, I want to submit my life to the God who created me. Because he's the one that, that is in charge. And he's the one that I need to follow. The second statement is that humility depends on God. Humility depends on God. Instead of depending on self and what you can do and what you can think and what you can accomplish, humility recognizes that that's really all up to God. Humility also recognizes that, that we can't save ourselves. That if, if we're going to have a right relationship with God, if we have any hope at all, it's going to have to come from God and not from us. So we depend on God for His grace and His forgiveness and His love and His salvation that only He can give. It depends on God for daily strength and for daily needs. It comes to God. So humility submits to God. It depends on God. And then humility serves others. Humility puts others first. When humility puts its shoes on, it serves. That's what humility does. Jesus said this. He said, he who would be greatest among you, let him be the servant of all. And then Jesus demonstrated that to his disciples by washing their feet. And, and he demonstrated humility even further than that. The Apostle Paul says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who did not consider equality with God something to be held on to, but humbled himself and became a man. And further, he humbled himself to death, even the death on the cross. And the reason Jesus did that was because he was serving us. Because when he was on the cross, he took our sins and our failures and our offenses. He took them himself and he gave himself for us, giving the sacrifice for our sins so that we could be forgiven and we could have eternal life. That's the ultimate act of servanthood. Jesus was the example of humility. Humility serves others. Now earlier I showed you the video 
about the wells. And you heard the voice of John Dinah. You didn't see his picture. So I want to show you his picture right here. This is uh, John Dinah. John is your IMB missionary that you help support with your cooperative program giving in Mozambique, Africa. And uh, he's been there 25 years, he and his wife, uh, faithfully serving. He not only gets involved in, in well projects and planting churches and, and sharing the gospel, but he also gets involved in projects like this one. In 2015, there was a really devastating flooding across Mozambique, and this is a very poor country. It's the fifth poorest country in the world. And, uh, and because of that, their crops were washed out. Uh, electricity was cut across the, uh, from the north to the south in that country. And uh, people lost their homes. But the most devastating thing was they lost their crops. Now, they depend on those crops to, as, they, uh, as they plant that rice. That rice that they harvest will carry them through an entire year. And when they lose that, that means there, there's going to be a terrible famine that is going to follow. So because John recognized that, he... Uh, partnered with another organization that you help support called Baptist Global Response, and they brought in rice, feed rice and seed rice. Now, br they brought in those two kinds of rice so that they would have uh, rice to give families who had already lost their homes, lost all the rice that they had to eat, and seed rice so that they could replant their fields. And for weeks, they worked tirelessly. They, would, they had, had these, these huge packages of rice. Uh, they, uh, they, they put out over 15,000 pounds of rice, seven, seven and a half tons. And they would load that rice up in trucks, they would go out to villages, they would, uh, they would put it into smaller packets, and then they would distribute those to families so that they would have enough to eat and enough to plant. And he did that for weeks, especially in one particular area called Posto Campo. I called John last week, and we were talking, and he shared this story with me, not because he thought I might share it with you, or he probably wouldn't have told me, but... He said, David, I was at a Posto Campo the other day, and he said, I was talking to the chef de Posto, who is the, the, the chief of that district. And he said, uh, you know, he said, we've named a variety of rice after you. John said, oh? Yeah. He said, you know, you came and you distributed all that rice to all of these people. And he says, they planted that rice. That rice has come up now. They've harvested it. And, uh, and it's coming up again, and, and they're eating that rice. And so everyone around calls it Johnny rice. <laughs> Johnny rice. You know, John didn't do what he did so that they'd name a variety of rice after him. But the truth is, those people recognized his humble service. He didn't do that because he had to. He did that because he wanted to. His heart went out to those people, and he wanted to serve them. And so he made sure that they had rice to eat and rice to plant. And, and he did all of that out of humility. And for weeks, they, they worked tirelessly to do that, sacrificially. And now those people have rice, and they've named that rice Johnny Rice. You know what Jesus said? Jesus said, he who humbles himself will be exalted. Now, that's not the reason that you serve, and that's not the reason you humble yourself, but it is a truth that Jesus gave, that when you give of yourself and you put others first and you serve, that, that people will recognize that. Humility. I love what Rick Warren said. Rick Warren said one time that humility is not thinking less of yourself. It is thinking of yourself less. Can I say that again? Humility is not thinking less of yourself. See, a lot of people think humility means you think, oh, I'm such a loser, and I always do things that are wrong, and I'm, I, I'm just an idiot. No, that's not humility. That's, that's putting yourself down, and, and God's not glorified by that either. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. So if you want to begin to put on humility, what you do is you put others first, and you serve them, and you think more about their needs than you think about your own, and you think about how, how you might be able to help them rather than how they can help you. Does that make sense? Our theme verse for this uh, sermon has been Proverbs 3.34 that says, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Now, there's two times that this verse is quoted in the New Testament. And one of the things I teach my students, and I've got a couple of students right there, one of the things I teach my students is if something is repeated in the Bible, pay attention because God is probably trying to tell you something. Well, this verse is repeated twice in the New Testament 
and both times teach us something very important about pride and humility. The first one teaches us about our relationship with God, and it comes from James chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. James chapter 4. You remember James? Don't you remember James? Jesus' brother. There you go. Here's what it says. James 4, 6 through 8. He says, But he, that is God, gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Here's what James says. If you want to have a relationship with God, you have to humble yourself. You have to be humble before God. You have to submit to Him. You have to admit that you're a sinner. You have to admit that you cannot be right with God by yourself. You have to admit that you need a Savior. The good news is that Jesus Christ gave His life to save you. But to begin a relationship with God and to have a relationship with God, you have to have humility. So humility is necessary for a relationship with God. It's also needed for our relationships with others because the other quote comes from Peter. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5, here's what he says. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another, for God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. If you want to have better relationships in your home, if you want to have a better relationship at work, better relationship with your neighbor, then try humility. Think more about their needs than about your own. Think about how you can serve them. Think about how you can put them first and respond with humility. I promise you, it'll change your marriage. It'll change your home. It'll change your relationships. Because we need humility. Proverbs warns us about pride. It tells us that we have to get rid of pride. And the only way to do that is to learn to be humble. How will you put pride in its place in your life? My prayer is that all of us will learn how to do that because it's the only way that we'll ever learn how to be more like Christ. Let's pray.